السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear colleagues and friends Hope that you are all doing well and fine uh, Our weekly meeting Today we are going to discuss One of the very important and hot topics In our daily practice And in the exam And from the legal point of view uh, It is one of our daily practice We are taking many decisions every day About the CTG uh, regarding the interpretation and the management plans. It is one of the uh, important topics in the exam for part two and part three examination. And if, from the legal point of view, the failure to interpret an abnormal CTG is the first cause of medical legal litigation in UK. And the second cause of litigation in UK is failure to react to an abnormal CTG. So it is one of the very important topics I will try my best to make it easy and to show what are the standards, methods, the standard definitions, and how to reach a standard interpretation and management plan. Before starting, one point I want to um, explain that the lecture for today is about the intrapartum fetal surveillance, the use of the CTG during labor, which is a little bit different than the non-stress test or the NST which will be done as a fetal surveillance method before the start of labor. The NST is either reactive or non-reactive. And reactive means at least uh, two movements associated with two acceleration in 20 minutes time period or non-reactive in which you can extend the duration for another 20 minutes and then you will react according to the finding for the non-stress test. This is different from today's uh, uh, topic, which is a CTG or the intrapartum fetal surveillance. So let's uh, start. We'll start today by how it will appear in the exam. It will come as a simulated colleague task where they will ask you to teach your junior colleague what are the indications of the CTG, how to interpret the CTG, and they will give you a piece of the trace and ask you to apply what you are teaching him in this piece of paper. We'll start with the objectives of today. We will summarize the fetal monitoring technique. We will explain the concepts of intermittent auscultation and the continuous electronic fetal monitoring. The most important part of today's topic is to discuss what are the standards, the standard terminology, the standard interpretation and the standard management plan. We can develop and reach an overall assessment and management plan in a systematic and organized way if we will follow the mnemonics of Dr. C. Bravado. Then finally, we can discuss some future researches in the fetal monitoring techniques. First part of this topic is the indications of fetal monitoring. Now, any baby during labor will be monitored, and the monitoring techniques will be either continuous electronic fetal monitor or intermittent auscultation. What are the indications for continuous electronic fetal monitoring? Any high-risk condition. This risk may be maternal medical complications like diabetes or hypertension, or obstetric complication like history of previous cesarean or post-term, or risk factors that may appear during delivery, intrapartum complications like induction or augmentation of labor are risk factors. Even the use of epidural analgesia is a risk factor, and these are indications for continuous electronic fetal monitoring from the maternal point of view. From the fetal point, any abnormality, known or suspected fetal condition, like for example, anomalies or IGR, are an indication for continuous electronic fetal monitoring during labor. If the pregnancy is low risk, no risk factors, either maternal or fetal, at this point you can choose between continuous and intermittent auscultation. How to choose? This will depend on the risk assessment, as we said before, either high risk or low risk. And the patient preferences after proper discussion before the start of labor. Very important point is the nursing staff, their availability their level of training, knowledge, and comfort, especially with intermittent auscultation because it needs 
more personal and more experience. Finally, the hospital protocol, all of us, we will follow our hospital policy, either to go for continuous for all patients or to choose between continuous and intermittent auscultation. Let's talk about some points in the history of continuous electronic fetal monitoring, which was introduced in 1960s. The main aim is to improve the neonatal outcomes, but unfortunately, this was not fulfilled. Why? Because it has limitations. It has points of strength at the beginning in the form of high sensitivity, which means category one or normal tracing are usually associated with good neonatal outcome. On the other side, the limitations, there is low specificity, which means that category three or pathological tracing are not always associated with poor outcome. And we can see this in our daily practice. So many ladies will be taken for cesarean section for abnormal trace and the result will be a very good baby, very active, and was, everything will be normal. So not all the abnormal traces are associated with poor outcome. And why? Because there is lack of reliability of interpretation. This is the main limitation of using the continuous electronic fetal monitoring, and that affects the outcome of this method of monitoring the baby during labor. Each one is reading the trace in his own way. There is no standards. There is no standard definition, no standard interpretation, and no standard management plan. And that's we will try to solve it today. One nice story. They did one study over 15 consultants. They give them the same traces today and after two weeks. They give today an interpretation and the management plan according to the trace they had. Then after two weeks, when they give them the same trace, they interpret the trace in a different way and they give a different management plan. Why? Because there was no standards how to interpret and how to manage an abnormal trace. When they compared the result between continuous electronic fetal monitoring and intermittent auscultation in a large number of randomized controlled trials over a very large number of patients, they found that there is no difference in the one minute upper score or the core page. No difference in the incidence of neonatal ICU admission or the rates of cerebral palsy. On the other hand, they found that there is increase in number of cesarean sections, increase in the incidence of operative vaginal deliveries. The only benefit from using the continuous electronic fetal monitoring was found that it reduces the incidence of early neonatal seizures. And early means after delivery, because when they followed these babies after one year, they found that these babies are okay. And the difference between those who underwent intermittent or continuous auscultation was not there. So even this benefit was not there after one year of delivery. So there is tendency to harm, and the limited benefit of the ele continuous electronic fetal monitoring because of lack of reliability of the standards. So intermittent auscultation is still has a rule, but if you are going to do intermittent auscultation, there are some recommendation you should follow to do it in the best way. First of all, if you are going to use the intermittent auscultation, you have to place the Doppler over the point of maximum intensity of the fetal heart sound. This point will be usually the back of the anterior shoulder in the most common presentation, which is accept to anterior presentation. So the first step is to put the Doppler over the point of maximum intensity. Then very important point, you have to differentiate between the maternal and fetal pulse. How to differentiate? Simply, put your fingers over the maternal pulse. If there is difference between the maternal pulse and the fetal heart means you are now you are auscultating the baby. But if they are the same, you have to differentiate because now you may be listening to the maternal pulse and you will admit the patient with a living baby. Then later you will discover that the baby was already dead. It will be a very unfortunate situation and it will carry very 
uh, unlikely medical legal issues if you admit one patient as a living baby and then you discover that the baby was dead and you were listening to the maternal pulse. So the first step is to put the Doppler over the point of maximum intensity, then differentiate between the maternal and fetal pulse. The next step is to palpate the uterus for contractions. Why? Because of two things. Number one, you cannot detect the baseline rate of the baby during the contractions. So in between the contraction, for 30 to 60 seconds, you will auscultate the fetal heart to establish the baseline. This is the first point. The second point, you will also auscultate the fetal heart with and after the end of contraction to detect if there is any potential decelerations. So you will palpate the maternal abdomen for contraction to auscultate in between contraction for 30 to 60 seconds to detect the baseline and to auscultate also during and immediately after the contraction to see if there is any associated decelerations. These points are very important if you are going to apply the intermittent auscultation. Why it is difficult to apply the intermittent auscultation? Because it needs more frequent follow-up and more frequent observation. Because you will listen to the fetal heart every 15 minutes in the first stage of labor and every five minutes in the second stage of labor. But in continuous electronic fetal monitoring, you will see the trace every 30 minutes in the first stage of labor and every 15 minutes in the second stage of labor if the patient has no complication. But if it is a complicated labor, you will see the trace or review the trace more frequently as an intermittent auscultation every 15 minutes in the first stage and every five minutes in the second stage of labor. So intermittent auscultation needs frequent observation and continuous electronic fetal monitoring, the trace will be there. You can have a look to the trace according if there is any complication or no complication. Usually, each 30 minutes in the first stage of labor and every 15 minutes in the second stage of labor. Very important point and very important safety point here. You have to document your finding at each time you will see the trace or you auscultate the fetal heart and this point has to be mentioned to your junior colleague during the teaching station. You should document your assessments or your finding in each time you review the trace or you auscultate the fetal heart. Now, to be organized, to reach an agreed interpretation and to put a proper management plan, we will follow the mnemonics of Dr. C. Bravado. You have to put these mnemonics in your head once you are in front of the trace. Go step by step. If we will follow the same steps, we will reach the same interpretation and we'll put the same management plan. So, Dr. DR4 determine the risk or define the risk. C4 contractions. BRA4 baseline rate. V for variability, A for acceleration, D for deceleration, and then O for the overall assessment. Dr. C. Bravado will go step by step and we'll see how to reach finally to the overall assessment. Dr. Ford determines the risk or defines the risk. As we said before, the risk, it may be antenatal risk factor, which may be maternal or fetal, it may be intrapartum risk factors, which is associated with abnormal fetal reserve or abnormal progress of labor. Why we are defining the risk? Because this will make a difference during managing the cases. You cannot put a patient with IUGR baby and preeclampsia. You cannot put her in the same category in a normal lady with a normal baby. So it may affect the management at the end, and it will increase your awareness about this case, especially at the time of handover, 
that you will tell your colleague who's coming to take over for the next shift to take care of this lady because she's at high risk. So any patient is high risk. What are the, the criteria of low risk patients? These patients are women with clear fluid. There is no bleeding. Everything during the antenatal care was normal. There is no concern regarding the fetal heart. And there is no condition affecting the fetal well-being and no requirement for oxytocin or prostaglandin. So these are criteria for low risk patient. So the first step of Dr. C. Bravado is to determine the risk or to define the risk. One or two very important safety points again. Before looking to the trace, you should know if you are using the trace with a paper speed of one cm per minute or three cm per minute. If you look at this strip, this is the same patient here and here, but here the machine is calibrated to one cm per minute paper speed and here at three cm per minute paper speed which means here, all the events that occur in one minute are recorded over one CM of the paper. Here, the events that occur in one minute are recorded over three CM. What is the difference? This one is using much paper. This one is using less paper, so it is a matter of reducing the cost. This one will be easier for interpretation. This one will need strict and standard definitions and interpretation to reach the same plan. But if you follow the same standards, it doesn't matter. But you need to know if it is one CM per minute or three CM per minute. This is the American way and this is the British way. Anyway, the interpretation by the end will not be different if you know this point. Why? Because here, if you look here, the large square equal one minute, and each large square is composed of six small squares. So each small square here equal 10 seconds. This is very important. The small square in the three cm per minute equals 10 seconds. But in the one cm per minute, the small square equals 30 seconds. So this is a very important safety point when you look to the trace. Also, when you look to the trace, you have to confirm the patient name and hospital number, because sometimes by mistake, you will interpret a trace for a different lady. And at this point, you may take a decision which is not for this lady. So the safety points here, you have to confirm the identity of the patient, her hospital number and her name. Number two, you have to look at the trace and see if it is one cm per minute, which means a small square equals 30 seconds, or three cm per minute, in which is a small square equals 10 seconds. Very important, again, one cm per minute in the first part. And then all of us, we know that there is vertical calibration for the fetal heart rate and for the contraction and the horizontal calibration. This is for the timing, usually, between these two lines, which has the fetal heart rate here and here, the distance here will be equal 10 minutes. So these are the 10 minutes, which is the least part of the trace. You can do an interpretation over it. So again, please, these are very important safety points. You have to confirm the identity of the patient and you have to know the paper speed. Again, if it is 1 cm, means the small square equals 30 seconds. If it is 3 cm, means the small square equals 10 seconds. So we finished, doctor, which is define or determine the risk. Then now for C, C4, the contractions. We all know that the contractions or true labor pains means contractions that are increasing in frequency, intensity, and duration are associated with bulging of the four water and associated with cervical changes. How we can detect the contraction? There are three ways to detect the contraction. 
either by palpation, abdominal palpation, by external transducer, or the best way by intrauterine pressure catheter. Please, if you are going to read the trace, it means only you are going to comment about the frequency of contraction. If you don't have intrauterine pressure catheter, it means you cannot comment about the strength of contraction from the trace. So again, if there is no intrauterine pressure catheter, the only comment will be about the frequency of contraction. But if you are going to detect the strength, either you put intrauterine pressure catheter or to feel by abdominal palpation and detect the duration of contraction. It will be mild if it is less than 20 seconds. It will be moderate from 20 to 40 seconds. And it may be strong if it is between 40 and 60 seconds. If the contraction is more than 60 seconds in duration, this is called hypertonic contraction. So again, the strength will be by the intrauterine pressure catheter or by abdominal palpation. But for the trace with external transducer, you will comment only about the frequency. So the normal frequency will be five or less contractions in 10 minutes. So the normal is five or less contractions in 10 minutes. If it is more than five contraction, this is called the tachy systole. Please, tachy systole. No hyperstimulation, no hypercontractility. These definitions or these terms are poorly defined and should not be used. So if you have contractions, more than five contractions in 10 minutes, these are called tachy systole. Still, some they consider if you have tachy systole with abnormality in the fetal heart, hyperstimulation, but in general, in general, tachycystole means more than five contractions. If you have an abnormality of the fetal heart with the tachycystole, you may consider it as hyperstimulation. Now, if you find tachycystole, how you will manage these cases? If you find more than five contractions in 10 minutes, you will ask yourself the first question. About the onset of labor, is it a spontaneous onset of labor or it was started by induction or augmentation? Let's go first with the spontaneous onset of labor. The second question, after you know that she has a spontaneous onset of labor, what about the tracing? Is it normal tracing or it is abnormal tracing? If it is a spontaneous labor and the normal trace, so this is the physiology of this patient, so there is no intervention required. But if she has a spontaneous labor and she has abnormality in the tracing, you will do intrauterine resuscitation measures and we'll mention it in details later. If the patient is not responding, there is no improvement in the trace. At this point, you will consider giving the colitic by subcutaneous terbitaline, 0.25 milligram. This is the only uh, tocolytics that can be used in this case. So this is the point if you have trying tachycystole and spontaneous onset of labor. But if you have tachycystole and the labor was induced or augmented, again, you will ask yourself, what about the trace? If the trace is normal, please decrease the uterotonics. But if the trace is abnormal, you will stop the uterotonics completely you will do the intrauterine resuscitation measures. If not responding, you will consider tocolysis. So this is a plan how to manage a case of uterine tachycystole. If you have more than five contraction, you will ask yourself, is it spontaneous or induced or augmented labor? Then ask yourself the second question, what about the trace? Is it normal or abnormal? And according, you will manage in each case either spontaneous or induced either normal or abnormal tracing so now we finished dr for define or determine the risk c for contraction and we know that the comment only on the trace about the frequency and how to measure the strength the third part is bra bra means baseline variability all of us, we know that the baseline is 110 to 160 beat per minute. But how to reach the baseline, you should follow some criteria or some recommendation. First of all, 
you cannot detect a baseline in a trace less than 10 minutes. So before you will have a strip of 10 minutes, you cannot detect the baseline by continuous electronic fetal monitor. So you should have at least 10 minutes. During these minutes, you will take two minutes. These two minutes, no acceleration, no deceleration, and no marked variability. If you find two minutes with the same criteria, you can detect the baseline. If you cannot find two continuous two minutes, you can use one minute from here and one minute from here, and you'll take the average baseline rate. If you have a segment, which is 10 minutes, that there is no proper criteria to choose the baseline, if you find any accelerations or deceleration or market variability in these 10 minutes, this is considered as intermediate trace, and you can go back to the previous 10 minutes to detect what is the baseline rate. So for detection of the baseline, you should have a strip of at least 10 minutes. During these 10 minutes, you will need two minutes without accelerations, without decelerations, and without market variability from which you can detect the baseline, which is normally 110 to 160 beats per minute. What are the abnormalities in the baseline? We all know that there is baseline bradycardia and baseline tachycardia. Here, another very important point, please concentrate, that you cannot consider the trace with bradycardia unless you have a baseline of less than 110 beats per minute for more than 10 minutes. So to consider that there is bradycardia, you should have a fetal heart less than 110 beats per minute for more than 10 minutes. If it is less than 10 minutes, it is considered deceleration and we will classify it later into different types. So again, when you say bradycardia, I will understand that the fetal heart is below 110 for more than 10 minutes. There are causes for bradycardia, either maternal or fetal. Please, always, when you are reading the trace, start thinking about the physiology before considering any pathology. So there are physiological causes of bradycardia, like the subine position that leads to subine hypotension. If there is some hypoglycemia or hypothermia, or there is excessive vagal stimulation, especially with pushing in the second stage of labor, all these are causes that may lead to bradycardia, and always there is also, you may find an apostological cause like tachycystole, like fetal distress, fetal causes like a prolonged cord occlusion or cord prolapse, fetal hypoxia, and if there is any congenital anomalies. Another important physiological point that may lead to bradycardia in post date babies. If the baby is post date, means the parasympathetic or the central nervous system is now mature, so the parasympathetic is controlling, so the heart rate will drop. So again, bradycardia means heart rate less than 110 beats per minute for more than, uh, for more than 10 minutes. You should consider the physiological causes like the subine position, hypotension, or vagal stimulation, especially in labor or post-date pregnancy, as a physiological causes of bradycardia. If no causes are found, then now you can search about the pathology like fetal hypoxia or cord prolapse or whatsoever. So this is the bradycardia. Now, the second abnormality in the baseline rate is baseline tachycardia. And once you say tachycardia, I will understand that the fetal heart is more than 160 beats per minute for more than 10 minutes. Again, more than 10 minutes. Before 10 minutes, it will be considered as prolonged, deceler prolonged acceleration. So the baseline tachycardia, this is the standard definition, will be the baseline heart rate is more than 160 for more than 10 minutes. Again, when you are considering the causes of tachycardia, think about the possible physiological causes before the fetal hypoxia. The possible causes like fever or infection or dehydration or maternal anxiety, but there are 
pathological causes, like if the patient received some drugs and fetal causes like anemia, like tachyarrhythmia, and in severe prematurity, the fetal heart will be more than usual. So again, when you are considering any abnormality, please search for the physiological causes before searching for the pathology. Expect the good thing before going into the bad because this will affect your interpretation and your rate of cesarean if you are searching for a variable cause. So this is for the baseline rate, what is the normal baseline rate, and what's abnormal, what is the definition of bradycardia, and what is the definition of tachycardia, and what are the possible causes for each one of them. So till now, Dr. Four define or determine the risk, C for contraction, and now we know how to detect the contraction and the CTG to comment about the frequency, tachycystole, and how we will manage tachycystole, then bra for baseline rate, the normal baseline rate from 110 to 160, what is the definition of bradycardia and what is the definition of tachycardia and what are the possible causes? The next is V for variability. Variability, actually, it is a very, or the most important part in the trace. Why it is the most important part? Because it is directly related to the CNS activity. It reflects the control of the central nervous system on the heart of the baby. Variability, it is the oscillation or fluctuation in the baseline rate. Previously, it was considered as short-term variability or long-term variability. Some were considering as good or bad or beautiful. So these are all not considered now. You will have to comment, you will have four types of variability to comment about the variability. Either absent variability, which means there is no amplitude range, it is a flat line, or minimal variability means amplitude range less than five beats per minute, or moderate variability, which is between six and 25 beats per minute, and market variability, which means more than 25 beats per minute. All of them are abnormal except the moderate variability. So the only normal variability is moderate variability, which is between six and 25. All other types of variability are abnormal, either absent, minimal, or market variability, all are abnormal. Moderate is the only normal variability. Again, there are so many reasons for decreased the variability. You have to consider the physiology before the pathology. The most common cause of decreased variability is cycles of sleep. The baby is a human being. He's taking some naps. He's going for sleep. It will take 20 to 40 minutes for each cycle. You cannot consider it abnormal unless it exceeds more than 40 minutes and you cannot intervene between two uh, duration or two, uh, double the duration of the cycle of sleep, which means around 90 minutes before taking intervention based only on the changes of the variability with no other associated abnormality. There are so many other reasons for decreased variability like prematurity, like drugs as corticosteroids and magnesium sulfate, like hypoxia and acidosis, any drugs also like CNS, depressant, and with fever. So these are the different types of variability and the possible causes, again, Please, the most common cause of decreased variability is fetal cycles, obviously. Here, this trace is showing absent variability. There is no amplitude range. It's like a straight line or what we are calling flat trace. Minimal variability, there are minimal oscillations in the baseline rate, but the amplitude is less than five beats per minute. The only normal one is moderate variability in which is the amplitude range is from six to 25. And what I mean by the amplitude range, it means the mm, upper point of the wave or the cycle and the lowest point, the difference between here and here, the difference between the top and the top of the cycle, then you will calculate the difference if it is between six and 25. This is moderate or normal variability. The main problem is in the marked variability. 
Actually, there is so many people who are not aware of the market variability. So many people will look to this trace and they say oh, very good, at very, very good trace. There are very good accelerations and they will just leave the patient and go. But actually, this is a very dangerous trace. Why? Because here there is loss of control from the central nervous system over the fetal heart. Here there is a fight or battle between the sympathetic nervous system, which is trying to pull the fetal heart up, and the parasympathetic, which is trying to pull it down. So there is loss of control over the fetal heart, and this is a preterminal condition if it lasts more than 50 minutes. So this is a marked variability, which is a very dangerous sign. Minimal or absent variability, all these are abnormal. The only normal is moderate variability. So next point is for acceleration. And we all know that acceleration means increase in the baseline rate more than 15 beats and the lasting more than 15 seconds. That's why it's very important to know if the trace is one, is one cm per minute or three cm per minute. If it is one cm per minute, it means the smallest square will be 30 seconds. If it is three cm per minute, it means the smallest square will be 10 seconds. And this will make a difference in interpretation now. So again, back to the acceleration, it means increase in the baseline rate more than 15 beats and the lasting more than 15 seconds. You may consider 10 beats and 10 seconds if the baby is preterm less than 32 weeks. So this is acceleration. So the acceleration, the heart rate increasing more than 15 beats and the lasting more than 15 seconds. The acceleration is called acceleration if the duration is from 15 seconds up to two minutes. So up to two minutes, it is considered acceleration. More than two minutes, but less than 10 minutes, it is considered as prolonged acceleration. So from 15 seconds to two minutes, it is acceleration. From two minutes to 10 minutes, it is considered prolonged acceleration. But if it lasts more than 10 minutes, now it will be considered as a new baseline tachycardia. Now we will go back to the definition of tachycardia. We have a fetal heart more than 160 for more than 10 minutes. So less than 10 minutes, it will be considered as prolonged acceleration. From 15 seconds to two minutes, it will be considered an acceleration. If it is less than 15 seconds, this is the market variability. So if you find increase in the baseline, more than 15 beats, but it is lasting less than 15 seconds, this will be the market variability. If it increased more than 15 beats and lasts more than 15 seconds, it is considered as acceleration till two minutes. After two minutes, it will be considered more longer acceleration. After 10 minutes, it will be considered as a new baseline tachycardia. So now we know what is the difference between market variability acceleration, prolonged acceleration, and new baseline tachycardia. The next will be about the deceleration. So we finished DR for define or determine the risk, C for contractions, BRA for baseline rate, V for variability, A for acceleration, now D for deceleration. The most worrying sign for all the obstetrician is deceleration. All of us, we know that the deceleration can be classified into early variable and delayed deceleration. The common mistake that most of the obstetrician are classifying it only according to its relation to the contraction. But to define the type of deceleration, you should define the rate of onset of the deceleration at first, then you will relate its time to the contraction. Before going to explain this point, the decelerations also can be described as recurrent deceleration or intermittent deceleration. What is the definition of recurrent? Recurrent means the deceleration are repeated in more than 50% of contraction 
in 20 minutes period. But the intermittent, the deceleration are recurrent in less than 50% of the contractions in 20 minutes period. So the deceleration can be classified into early, late, and variable, and also can be classified into recurrent and intermittent. Recurrent more than 50% of contraction, intermittent less than 50% of contraction in 20 minutes period. Now, how to define if it is early, late, or variable. As I said, don't go to the contraction from the start. Don't look to the contraction from the beginning. You have first to detect the onset of deceleration. The rate of onset of deceleration. The rate of onset means the timing between the baseline here and the lowest point of the deceleration here. So you have to count this duration. If the duration is more than 30 seconds, it means this is gradual onset of the deceleration. If it is less than 30 seconds, it means this is an abrupt onset of the deceleration. So again, the first step in defining the type of deceleration is to know the type of onset of the deceleration. We have two types of onset for the deceleration, either gradual onset or abrupt onset. What is the definition of gradual and what is the definition of abrupt? Gradual means the distance from the baseline to the lowest point of the deceleration is more than 30 seconds, which means more than three small squares in the three cm per minute and more than one small square in the one cm per minute. Again, it is very important to know if it is 1 cm or 3 cm because it will make your interpretation completely different. So if we look here, this one is 3 cm per minute. So each small square equals 10 seconds. So from here to here, we can count 1, 2, and 3. So more than 30 seconds. So this is gradual onset of the deceleration. Gradual onset you will have two options. If it is gradual onset of deceleration, it will be either early or late deceleration. Now you have gradual onset. The second step in defining the type of deceleration is to look to the relation between the deceleration and the contraction. If you find that the deceleration is mirroring the contraction, mirror image of the contraction, this is an early deceleration. If it is coming after the contraction, this will be late deceleration. So early deceleration, how you define early deceleration? This means from the onset of the deceleration to the nadir is 30 seconds or more. Now, this is gradual onset. I will look to the relation to the contraction. If it is a mirror image of the contraction, it means this is an early deceleration. And early deceleration, it is caused by fetal head compression, which may be a good physiological sign of compensation of the baby to the compression during the delivery. So this is the first type of deceleration, which is early deceleration. The second type of deceleration is variable deceleration. And variable deceleration means, number one, there is an abrupt onset of the deceleration. What is the meaning of abrupt onset? Means from the baseline, to the nadir is less than 30 seconds, less than three small squares if it is three cm per minute, and less than one small square if it is one cm per minute. So from the onset to the nadir is less than 30 seconds. And here in variable deceleration, once you find that the onset is abrupt, there is no need to look to the relation between the deceleration and the contraction because variable deceleration, it may come with the contraction after the contraction or before the contraction. So in variable deceleration, how to define? By abrupt onset of the deceleration, which means less than 30 seconds from the baseline to the nadir of the deceleration. Variable deceleration is the most common type of deceleration in the trace. Why? Because the cord is there inside with the baby. So with any movement or any compression over the cord, it will lead to variable deceleration. Variable deceleration is classified in two types. 
either benign variable deceleration or concerning variable deceleration. As we said, the cord is there with the baby is inside, inside the womb. So with contractions, with the baby movement, he may hit the cord and this will result in benign variable deceleration. What are the criteria of benign variable deceleration? It will be sudden onset and rapid recovery. It will come down and go up again very quickly. So the duration is less than 60 seconds. The duration of benign variable deceleration will be less than 60 seconds, rapid onset and rapid recovery. You will find moderate baseline variability before, after, and during the deceleration. So the variability is moderate variability, which is the only normal variability as we mentioned before. You will find shouldering before and after the deceleration. If you find a shouldering, it means it is a very good physiological sign. It reflects a normal compensation resulting from compression of the vein at the beginning, then the arteries in the umbilical cord. So these are the criteria of benign variable deceleration. Sudden onset, rapid recovery, duration less than 60 seconds, presence of shouldering, and moderate variability in the baseline and in the deceleration itself. The other type of variable deceleration is concerning variable deceleration. Here, the duration will be more than 60 seconds, so there is prolonged compression over the cord. The variability will be reduced in the baseline and within the deceleration itself. You will find a biphasic wave at the base of the deceleration, and there is no shouldering. The baby is tired. There is no compensation. It doesn't matter which one is compressed, the artery or the vein. But here, the baby is compensating. So the variable deceleration again, it means deceleration which has an abrupt onset. And the abrupt onset means from the onset to the nadir of the deceleration is less than 30 seconds. Now there is no need to look to the relation between the deceleration and the contraction because variable deceleration may come at any time. And the variable deceleration is the most common type of deceleration you will face in the trace. It may be benign variable deceleration or concerning variable deceleration. The last type of deceleration is late deceleration. And as we mentioned before, we will have two types of onset, either gradual onset, which means from the baseline to the nadir more than 30 seconds. The gradual onset means it's either early or late. So once you have gradual onset of the deceleration, now look to the relation to the contraction. This deceleration is coming following the contraction. So this one and this one will be late deceleration. So late deceleration, gradual onset of contraction then gradual onset of deceleration then and it's coming after the contraction so it's late but if it is gradual onset and coming with the contraction it will be early if it is an abrupt onset this means it's a variable deceleration and we all know that the delayed deceleration is very dangerous because it reflects that there is utero placental insufficiency and decrease in the fetal reserve so this is regarding the deceleration. Now we know that we have to define the onset at the beginning. Please remember this point because it is a common mistake just to interpret the deceleration by its relation to the contraction. The variable deceleration may have different types of relation to contraction. So how to differentiate first the onset, gradual or abrupt onset, then if it is gradual, you will look to the relation to the contraction to differentiate between early and late deceleration. But if it is abrupt onset, it means it is variable deceleration and there is no need to look at the relation to the contraction. Another important type of deceleration is prolonged deceleration. What is the definition of prolonged deceleration? It is a deceleration that lasts more than three minutes. So remember here with the prolonged deceleration, the rule of three. From zero to three minutes, this will be the diagnosis. So you will diagnose the prolonged deceleration after three minutes. From three to six minutes, you will start doing the intratrine resuscitation measures. You will put the patient on the left lateral, you will stop the hydrotonics, you will give fluids, oxygen if the patient uh, is hypoxic. So 
the first three minutes for diagnosis, from three to six minutes for intrauterine resuscitation, from six to nine minutes, it will be for time of shifting the patient to the OT, and from nine to 12 minutes, the baby has to be out. So if the prolonged deceleration lasts more than nine minutes without improvement, you have to do immediate cesarean section and take the baby out within the last three minutes before 12 minutes, because this is the maximum time that the baby can uh, be delivered without abnormalities in spite of complete anoxia or mm, prolonged hypoxia. So prolonged deceleration means deceleration lasting more than three minutes. Then from three to six minutes for intrauterine resuscitation, from six to nine minutes time of transfer to the OT, from nine to 12 minutes, the baby has to be out. What are the causes of sudden drop in the fetal heart? Again, always think about the physiology. So a rupture of membrane or amniotomy may cause sudden drop in the fetal heart. The vaginal examination. If you are fixing intrauterine pressure caster or scalp electrode, maternal hypotension and position changes, vagal maneuvers, all these are causes of sudden drop in the fetal heart, but also there are other causes like rupture uterus, like cord prolapse, like severe placental abruption. So please think about the physiology, about going to the pathology. So these are the causes of sudden decrease in the fetal heart rate. Please always, when you find any abnormality in the trace, the first thing to do is to adjust the maternal position and to check her vital signs to exclude the possibility of hypotension and then do BV examination to check if there is anything wrong there. A sinusoidal pattern or the snake pattern. It is a terminal sign. If you find a sign like wave like this, that's repeated in a frequency of three to five per minute and persisting for 20 minutes or more. If less than 20 minutes, you may consider that the cause is narcotics that the patient may receive. But if it lasts more than 20 minutes with a cycle frequency of three to five per minute, this means this is a sinusoidal pattern and it may be due to fetal anemia. Fetal anemia, there is bleeding somewhere and there is evolving hypoxia. And as I said, this is a terminal sign that needs rapid evaluation and you have to consider immediate delivery. So sinusoidal pattern is again, very dangerous sign. You have to exclude the possibility of narcotic induced if more than 20 minutes and cycle frequency more than three to five per minute, you will expect that there is a problem somewhere. Usually there is fetal maternal hemorrhage somewhere which needs rapid evaluation and immediate delivery. So we finished doctor for determine or define the risk. C for contraction, bra for baseline rate, V for variability, A for acceleration, D for deceleration, and then O for the overall assessment. According to this, you will reach the overall assessment. Here, we will define the trace or we will reach a final assessment according to the three-tier approach. Category one, which is normal, category two, which is suspicious trace, and category two, which reflect the pathological trace. The management will be based according to the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology practice bulletin and the NICE guideline 2017 and 19. So the management will be based here on clinical context and the management should include the plan for further surveillance. According to the fetal heart rate abnormality, you will do the corrective measures and the further steps for management. So the three tier means we have three categories, category one, category two, and category three. Category one, normal trace. There is no risk here. It needs only routine follow-up and it reflects a normal acid-base status of the baby at the time of observation. Category three, it is high risk and predictive of abnormal fetal pH and it needs prompt intervention 
and immediate delivery. Category two, which is a suspicious, you can easily consider it as a category which is not category one and is not category three. Actually, it is not predictive of abnormal fetal pH, and there is you will be unable to classify it into category one or category three due to insufficient data. So the overall assessment, according to the three-tier approach, it will be either category one, which is normal, category three, which is the pathological, or category two, which is the suspicious. Category two, you can classify it as category which is not category one or category three for easier way of interpretation. Here, how to define the categories according to the American College and according to the RCOG. Both of them, they have the final interpretation, but in a different way. The easiest way to remember either this way or this way is to know what is category one and what is category three. Category two will be the category which is not category one and which is not category three. So category one, everything is normal. The baseline from 110 to 160, there is moderate baseline variability. Acceleration may be present or absent. It's not mandatory to be present. Early deceleration may be present or absent because early deceleration is physiological, but there is no late or variable deceleration. So this is category one here. Category three means a sinusoidal pattern or absent fetal heart rate variability. The variability, it should be absent to consider it as category three associated with recurrent late deceleration, recurrent variable deceleration, or prolonged deceleration or bradycardia. So this is the American way and the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development recommendation. Category one and category three, if not category one, and if not category three, it will be category two. Any other abnormality it will be considered as category two, which is found in more than 80% of the labor traces. So the easiest way to remember category one is normal. Category three, either sinusoidal pattern or absent variability together with late or variable deceleration or prolonged deceleration or bradycardia. If we'll go to the Royal College way, also, the easiest way is to do the same. Remember that there are reassuring criteria and abnormal criteria. If you manage to remember the reassuring and abnormal, anything else will be non-reassuring because so many points here, you will, it will make you uh, disturbed and it will be difficult to remember. So reassuring means the heart rate is 110 to 160, the variability is moderate from 5 to 25, no deceleration or early deceleration or variable deceleration with no concern criteria for less than 90 minutes. These are the reassuring signs. What are the abnormal signs? The baseline rate will be blue 100 or more than 180. And the variability, it will be less than 5 for more than 50 minutes or more than 25 for more than 25 minutes, or it is sinusoidal pattern. Again, it's almost the same. Here, you will remember that the type of deceleration, it will be either variable deceleration with concern criteria in more than 50% of contraction for 30 minutes or less if there is any other risk. That's why determine the risk from the beginning is important. This is regarding the variable deceleration or late deceleration for less than 30 minutes or acute bradycardia or prolonged deceleration for more than three minutes. So this is how to classify into reassuring and abnormal any other type of deceleration, any other type of abnormality in the baseline variability, any other abnormal fetal heart will be considered as a non-reassuring sign. So it will be difficult to remember it. So the easiest way, please remember what's category one or the normal or reassuring sign, what's category three or the pathological or abnormal signs, and anything else will be considered as category two or non-reassuring. For the normal trace, according to the NICE, all features are reassuring. 
if it is suspicious trace, you will find one non-reassuring feature and two reassuring features. The pathological, it will be either one abnormal feature or two non-reassuring features. So all what you need to remember to know, all the reassuring, all the, no, uh, the abnormal, and anything else you find in the trace is non-reassuring. If you find one non-reassuring, it will be suspicious. Two non-reassuring or one abnormal, it will be a pathological trace. But there are some exceptions that needs urgent intervention, as in case of acute bradycardia or prolonged deceleration for more than three minutes. These will need urgent or uh, urgent, uh, inter, uh, urgent evaluation by the obstetrician. Here you don't have time to do a fetal scalp BH, but if it is pathological, you still have time to do the fetal scalp BH, but here you will go directly for management, either delivery by cesarean or instrumental delivery. So this is how to interpret that trace. So again, we'll have either category one or normal trace, this will need routine management. Category three or abnormal trace, this will need intrauterine resuscitation measures, and then you need to consider immediate delivery. What if you find the category two or suspicious trace? This is a problem. What you need to do? Either you will do for you will go for routine manage or for more uh, surveillance, continuous surveillance, and continuous intrauterine resuscitation or you need to go for prompt delivery or immediate delivery. So the problem always in the interpretation of the trace was in category two or category two or the suspicious trace. Before going to explain how to manage category two, what are the intrauterine resuscitation measures? Actually, when you are doing intrauterine resuscitation measures, you have to consider what are the abnormalities you have and then consider what's your goal then consider what you are going to do. So if you have recurrent late deceleration or prolonged deceleration or bradycardia, minimal or absent fetal heart rate variability, you need to increase the fetal oxygenation and improve the utero-placental blood flow. So put the mother in left lateral position, give her oxygen if she's hypoxic, give intravenous fluids and reduce the uterine contraction frequency by reducing the uterotonics. If you have tachycystole with abnormal tracing, reduce the uterine activity, stop the oxytocin or the cervical ripening agent, and you may need to administer tocolytics like subcutaneous terbutaline. If you have variable deceleration or prolonged deceleration or bradycardia and there is cord compression, so maternal positioning here will be the knee chest position, or you put two fingers to elevate the head away from the cord, and you will consider delivery according to the fetal heart, either category one or category two cesarean section. Or category two, because there was conflict how to manage category two, there is new recent proposals for management of category two tracing. The Clark algorithm, which is this one, and the five-tier classification rather than the three tier, which we described before category one, two, and three. Both of them have a standard terminology and they are developing evidence to support them. Both of them are relatively complicated. So there is mobile applications for them to make the interpretation is easier. The Clark algorithm is only for category two. So if you have category two, you can use the Clark here. And the Clark depending mainly on the presence of moderate variability or acceleration, and also the recurrent significant deceleration. So in Clark algorithm, first, you will ask yourself, if I have a moderate variability of acceleration, yes or no. Then if you have significant deceleration in more than 50% of contraction in one hour, the second question you will ask yourself is, how is the progress of labor? Which stage of labor we are? Latent, active, or second stage of labor? And according to the progress, you will go for cesarean, or you will observe, or you will do operative vaginal delivery. But if there is no moderate variability or acceleration, 
it means that the baby now in more serious condition. So you will look for the significant deceleration in only 30 minutes. And according, if you don't have moderate variability or acceleration, and there is significant deceleration in 30 minutes, you will go for immediate delivery. If no moderate variability or acceleration, but the deceleration are less than 50% in less than 30 minutes, you may observe one hour, but you will review the trace every 30 minutes. So this is Clark. I know you, you may feel it difficult, but we will, I will show you now how to use the mobile application. The second part is a five tier. The five tier instead of the previous one we mentioned before, which is a three tier, it is a color coding system. Five colors you have starting from the green going to the red. The difference in the color with it indicates the risk of acidemia and the risk of evolution. What is the meaning of risk of evolution? It means the ability of one color to change to the next color. So it is going from less serious to more serious condition. The first three colors, the green, blue, and yellow, it indicates that there is, there is zero risk of acidemia, but still the risk of evolution is increasing from one color to another one. The last two colors, which are the orange and red, it indicates that there is risk of acidemia and there is high risk of evolution. So both of these colors needs urgent intervention. The difference between the red and the orange is the priority in the labor world. So if you have one red and one orange, means you will take this one first, then this one. The five tier, it depends on the variability. At the beginning, what, which kind of variability, either moderate, either minimal, or absent variability. Then the next step will be the baseline rate. What is the baseline rate, either normal, bradycardia or tachycardia, and then the type of deceleration, either early or recurrent rate or recurrent variable or prolonged deceleration. So you will adjust if moderate variability, for example, and there is normal fetal heart rate, but there is mild recurrent late deceleration, so it will be blue color. What is the meaning of blue color? It means that there is zero risk of acidemia and low risk of evolution. So this is a five-tier system. And because both of them are complicated, we, I'm going to show you how to use it on the mobile application. So I have to shift now to the mobile. So there are the mobile applications for both of them. The five tier is a paid for $3, I think, and the clerk So, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry because uh, I'm using the mobile now uh, together with the computer in the same time. So, let me show, let me show you how to use it. So now we, so have, now we have two applications. applications. Number one is, Number one the, is Clark the Clark algorithm. The Clark, the Clark algorithm here, here it's, only it's only applicable for category, category two tracing. tracing. So, so my patient is in category two. Now, now he will ask, he will ask you if the patient is in latent or active phase. Let's say, for example, she's in the active phase. In the, in the first stage, stage of labor, she's having, she's having normal, normal progress. progress. She's having she's moderate variability or acceleration, let's say no. There is, there is any recurrent, recurrent significant deceleration, let's say yes, between 30 and 60 seconds. So the decision, so decision here will be the cesarean section. But, but the algorithm, the algorithm can be overridden at any time 
If the doctor, doctor feels that, that it is in the benefit of the patient or believes that, that, that is in the best, in the best interest, interest of the fetus to interfere, to interfere sooner, sooner than, than later. later. So, so the good part of the clerk is giving you a chance to use your clinical sense, to use your clinical The other type sense. or the other application is the five tier. The other type or the other application is the five tier. So in five tier, you are going here. So in five tier, open the application. You are going the here to will ask you open the, the application. The first Let's system will ask you about the type of variability. And Let's say moderate variability is tachycardia. And the fetal heart rate is tachycardia. And you will, and have, you will have variable dehydration between, between 70 and 80 minutes per minute. For less than, for less than 30, 30 seconds, so the color, so the color here, here will, be will be blue. What is the definition, is the definition of, the of the blue? Means there is means no, there is risk, of no risk of acidemia and the low risk, and the low risk of pollution. So he will, so give, he will you give you instructions. What are the, what instructions? Are the instructions? You have to change, have to the, change position the position of the patient. Give her give oxygen. Her oxygen. If, she's if she's hypoxic, correct, correct the hypotension. Give bolus, decrease the uterus tonics, or give to colitics if there is tachycystole. Avoid constant motion and, and notify, notify the obstetrician. And, and this is a this category, is a category to tracing. So, so these are, are the two applications, the two applications that you can use in this case. Again, I will go back to the screen. So now, know how to use Clark and how to use the 5T. What about the BH? Actually, the use of fetal scalp BH is uh, now reduced. Uh, either to use the BH or the serum lactate to detect the condition of the baby. There are alternatives which are non-invasive methods, like the scalp stimulation or the acoustic stimulation. According to the response to this stimulation, if you have any acceleration, either spontaneous or stimulated by scalp stimulation or acoustic stimulation, this means that this baby is in good condition. If accelerations are present in response to stimulation, most probably the BH will be more than 7.2. But if there is no response to stimulation, if there is no acceleration, it doesn't mean anything. And you have to search for another way to check the fetal condition. So this is alternative to scalp BH is to do fetal scalp stimulation and assessment of the variability of the fetal heart rate. So the most important two criteria of the tracing now are moderate variability and accelerations. Accelerations either spontaneous or induced by, induced by acoustic stimulation or fetal scalp stimulation. If as a result of stimulation, you find acceleration, most probably the pH will be more than 7.2, but there are less data regarding the interpretation of no acceleration are present. So these are the alternatives to the fetal scalp pH. The future monitoring research, there are some researches about the use of fetal ECG for STAN or ST segment automated analysis. It is expensive. Uh, it did not reduce the operative deliveries and the fetal scalp sampling. So it is expensive and it doesn't change a lot. The second is continuous fetal uh, oximetry. There is no proven benefit and it's only used in research setting. The last is computerized CTG. Uh, it is now applicable, but is still awaiting for further studies to evaluate its effectiveness. And in the future, I think they will uh, depend mainly on uh, everything will be computerized to avoid the lack of reliability in interpretation, as we said in the beginning. Very important safety criteria. 
You have to advise each one, and you have to advise your junior colleague during the teaching station is don't carry the responsibility of reading the trace alone. There should be fresh eye opinion, and the fresh eyes opinion, it can be done at least hourly, or some other trust is can be done each two hours. The second person or the second colleague or the fresh eye, he will agree with your opinion, yes or no. If he does not agree to your interpretation, he will fill a new sticker. This is called the CTG sticker that has to be fixed in the file of each patient in labor. So the CTG sticker, you will put your interpretation either normal, suspicious, or pathological trace. Then the fresh eye will come to agree or disagree. If he disagree, he has to fill a new sticker. So this is a very important point. Please make it a teamwork. Ask for someone else to interpret the trace of the patient during the labor. So in summary, I know it was very long, but it was very important. So in summary, the continuous electronic fetal monitoring is widely used, but intermittent auscultation is still acceptable and may be preferable in low risk patients. Please remember the mnemonics of Dr. C. Bravado. It will provide you with a systematic and organized way to define the tracing. Use the recommendation for the standard terminology and the standard interpretation. You can use the ACOG or the RCOG guidelines, but by the end, they are the same with some little differences. Uh, in your clinical practice, you may download the five-tier application or you can uh, download the uh, Clark algorithm for easier uh, interpretation and easier uh, management plans. Remember that the presence of moderate variability and or acceleration is very important for ensuring that the baby status is okay and for utilizing it in the management of category two tracing. Another point you can add uh, for this station, that certification or training is very important for all staff to reach a standardized interpretation to reduce the variability uh, or inter-observer inter -observer variability or disagreements. So thank you so much. It was useful. And uh, I, again, I will arrange uh, another uh, session where we will discuss how to go through the station. I will announce on the group. Uh, if you find it useful, please share it with your friends and remember me in your prayers. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.